Well, good morning, everyone. Everyone, welcome to this morning's study, and uh, we're going to continue our study on uh, Daniel chapter eleven by looking at uh, these this chronology of um, the civil wars, both in uh, ancient Israel and in American history, and how they're connected to our history. So, before we begin, can you join me in a word? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can be here this morning to study your word together. We invite your spirit to speak to our hearts, and we ask that you can guide and direct as we look at uh, the symbols in this history, uh, especially um, as we're looking at chapter 13. And Jeroboam, we just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can reveal truth to us and that we can understand your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Um, so we were looking at, well, we went through chapter 11 and chapter 12. And we started looking at chapter 13. Now, we know that there's there's lots that we've looked at. We haven't put it all together. And maybe it's going to take us a bit of time. Uh, we know that there is at the end, well, in Solomon's reign, there's going to be three enemies, three adversaries, uh, one of them being uh, Jeroboam. Uh, when Solomon dies, Jeroboam is going to take over the northern kingdom. And uh, and when he does so, he's going to set up these golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And he's going to do this his his reasoning is he doesn't want people to go back uh, to Israel to the king king because it might end in his death if if people turn back uh, to God, and so he he decides to build these um, altars with these golden calves at Dan and Bethel Dan way in the north Bethel way in the south, uh, so the people don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. Of course, he sets up a counterfeit. Fit feast day. Now, this is an important detail when we start looking at American history. Um, now, we've we've seen a number of symbols. Um, the eleventh day of the first month uh, being one of them. Uh, Eleven seventeen being another, and uh, we also, which of course is connected to July eighteenth as a symbol. And in this story, we started looking at. Um, some of the symbols. So one is we have altar, altar. So we, we can see that this is a symbol of the midnight cry and because it's a doubling. Now, the other thing about this number 4196 is um, that it is uh, divisible by 187. So if you divide it by 187, the symbol for July 18, uh, is that right? I'm going to do this wrong. I might have done that wrong. Never mind. It's not divisible by 187. Uh, 1496 is divisible by 187. So I have to mix, mix those numbers around, and that's 8. So I don't know if that's significant. Um, so 4196, I don't know why I did that backwards. 4196 is... Uh, there was something else. Oh, that's what I have to do. So yeah, so 1496. So if I mix those numbers around, I don't know if that's significant. I forgot that I had done that. Um, so we have this altar altar. So this is a doubling. And uh, we also have uh, uh, this sign. So we have this this word sign 4159 um, has similar digits to this. Now this sign moped. Um, and what was the about the sign? I'm trying to remember. Wonder sign. So there was something where we had, I'm trying to remember what it was. Uh, I don't even remember. I'm looking at too many things. Um, so there's something about this sign 
and this altar. So the word altar is uh, this sign. I can't remember. I know that we're going to have this sign doubled. So we ended up looking at, okay, so the question is, that, well, that was what it was. So what was the sign? The sign was, what was the sign? This altar is going to be broken, right? So it's going to, it's going to have, and it's going to, uh, be rent and, uh, the ashes are going to be poured out. Now we know that the altar, the Josiah, he's going to, um, come. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones so shall be burnt upon thee. Now, the idea that Josiah is going to be born, uh, the name Josiah means founded of Yah, right? So it has a word uh, there that has to do with uh, foundation. Um, it's It's also... Um, uh, it can also mean whom Jehovah heals, right? So there's different ways in which the word is understood. Um, now he's going to be a son of Ammon, right? So he's the grandson of uh, uh, Manasseh. And what else about Josiah? So we know that there's this prophecy of Josiah. What else is the significance of Josiah? We know that there's Josiah Lich. So we had this prophecy of Josiah connected to its fulfillment. So we looked at that in 2 Kings uh, 23, where it's going to talk about moreover. So moreover in verse um 15, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. So we're going to have this prophecy of Josiah. And we know that Ezekiel is going to reference this prophecy. So in Ezekiel chapter 4, he's going to have to lay on his uh left side for 390 days and then on his right side for 40 days and he's going to uh, begin lying on his left side for um on july 21st 592 bc and we know that relates to midnight in millerite history and 390 days later he's going to Cease lying on his left side, and that's going to be the tenth day of the fifth month. So he's going to start on the um, the fifth day of the fourth month. He's going to end on the tenth day of the fifth month, one year later, and then uh, he's going to begin uh, lying on his uh, right side for forty days, and that's going to be on August fifteenth. Right. So he's going to be so he has this August 15th, which is the midnight cry, and he begins at midnight. So when we're dealing with this uh, way mark. So if we go back to. To this story, uh, one of the things that we have to uh, try to understand is how does this this story in 977 why is this story connected to this prophecy of Josiah? What is the prophecy of Josiah really about? It's about the destruction of Jerusalem and the 390 years and the 40 years. Um, these are based on a day for a year, the 390 days and the 40 days. So I'm trying to ask a question. It's, it's a fairly broad question that I want you to think about. So, um, I don't know the best way to do this. Uh, probably what I could do is I could use the whiteboard. It might be easier to draw this out. 
So I'm going to do that. So just hang on a second. See how this works with me. Having the whiteboard this close is going to work. We'll see how it works. Okay. So the first thing we have to consider is that back in 977 BC, we have uh, this date, November 22nd. So that's the Julian date for this event. And this is going to be the 15th day of the eighth month. So this is a symbol. This symbol is tied to the covenant, 158 BC, right? It's also tied to August 15th, 1844. Okay. And then we're going to have uh, 350 years. Pardon me, 300 and, yeah, 350 years. And this is going to be um, in 627 BC. So this is uh, the 13th year. We'll put it up here. 13th year of Josiah. So in his 13th year, he's going to... Um, Break down the altar of Bethel. So you have a prophecy here. And a fulfillment. Okay, so you have a prophecy with its fulfillment. So hopefully you can see that, okay? Now, we're going to have over here, you're going to have Josiah. We're not just that, Ezekiel. So this is in 592 BC. And Ezekiel is going to be given this vision. And this vision is going to be um, in the 30th year of the fifth day, of the fourth month. And it's also, well, I guess maybe what I should do here. It's in the fifth year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, but it's also the 30th year of a Jubilee cycle. Jubilee, Jubilee cycle. So it's the 30th year of a Jubilee cycle. It's the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. It's the fifth day of the fourth month. And it's July 21st, right? So it's all of those things. Now, he's going to, so these, uh, this period of time, so we're going to know from here, it's going to be uh, 35 years. Right. Maybe I'll do it this way. I'm going to put in five years here. So this is going to be the Passover of Josiah, 622 B.C. That's where you're going to have this Passover. And that's, that's going to be 30 years between here and here. So the year of that Passover is going to be marking uh, the first year of a Jubilee cycle. It's going to begin in that year in 622 BC. And then you have 30 years. And um, then what you're going to have is uh, he's going to lie on his left side. So I'm going to draw this here. So here you are on July 21st. Um, in 592, and he's going to lie on his left side. Now, he's going to be facing uh, the siege. So, do it this way. Siege. So, this is the siege. He's going to make this siege. He's going to lay out this siege. He's going to create battering rams. He's going to make a mock-up of Jerusalem. And he 
he's going to face that. So he's going to be facing this siege and he's going to lie on his left side for 390 days. Okay. And then this date here, this 390 days, is going to end on the 10th day of the fifth month. Right. So this symbol here is going to be the symbol for the destruction of the temple. So we'll pay attention to that. And then he's going to, uh, for 40 days, he's going to lie on his right side. Now, he's going to be facing this siege here as well. So he lies on his right side. Oops, siege there. The right side for um, 40 days. Now, what some people do is they say, well, this is 430 days, and it must represent a 430-day period. But we know... That it's, I'm, and I'm pointing where he's facing. Obviously, he's not going back in time here. Uh, but because he's on his left side and then on his right side and facing the siege, it shows that they point towards a certain point, which is uh, going to be marking what ends up happening, uh, which is going to be the siege. So, and that's what this is going to point to. So, when we look at when the siege of Jerusalem happens, um, this is going to be in uh, 587 BC, right? So the siege is going to begin five years later. And this is going to occur on uh, the 10th day of the 10th month, right? That's when the siege is going to begin. This is going to be in the ninth year of not Jehoiachin's captivity because he's not counting it that way. It's going to be the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign. Now they overlap the years of the captivity and the years of the reign. But anyway, this is going to be on the 10th day of the 10th month. And it's, um, uh, the date is going to be like January 5th or January 6th, something like that. 597, 587 BC. So it's just at the beginning of 587. And then uh, you're going to have a siege for a year and a half. And then in the summer of 586, on the 10th day of the fifth month, you're going to have uh, the temple destroyed. And then you're going to have six months, so a half a year. And then on uh, the fifth day of the 10th month, we're going to have another event, and that's going to be um, the escapee returns. So you have this escapee returns. So that's going to be... Um, Altogether, if you go up to here, I'm going to do this here. This is going to be 390 years. And then this, you've got this year and a half. And of course, this is the end of Zedekiah's reign. So we know that the period of the kings of Judah, that shows up there, that doesn't. Put it down here. 390 years, kings of Judah. It's going to be 390 years and a half. Right? So that's going to be this whole period of time. 391.5, right? So this is this symbol that we've had 391 and a half years. It's tied to the prophecy of Messiah as well. So I don't know if that helps. Okay. Hopefully that's big enough for people to see. So I wanted to draw this out because um, rather than just looking at the slide. Um, so we should be able to see that this, uh, this prophecy of Josiah, which we've gone through before, I've done lots of presentations on it, 
that its connection here to this civil war is going to connect us to the prophecy of Josiah, which is the 391 and a half. But it's also going to connect us to um, to our history. Right. Because we're going to see that this civil war is connected. Now, the question is, why is why is Ezekiel referencing this? Why is he referencing the prophecy of Josiah? Because we, we know that he, he's referencing it because we, we figured this out, that, that this is the starting point for both. Uh, this here is going to be the 40 years, right? So you can see the 40 years here. Let's get like that. So you've got the 40 years. And, and they're both going to end here, right? So the 40 days represent the start of the siege. And the 390 days, the start of the siege. So you have these two overlapping day for a year prophecies. And they're going to push point to this date, the 10th day of the 10th month in 587. Though, because of this 10th day, the 5th month date, and also his third vision, which is on the 10th day, the 5th month, he's going to be pointing to the temple being destroyed on the 10th day, the 5th month as well. So Ezekiel's prophecy is directly addressing the siege that's going to result in the destruction of the temple a year and a half later, right? So, so he has a 390 year prophecy, but it, it's, it's culmination really is 391 and a half years, which we know from, uh, Josiah Lich's prophecy is 391 years and a half a month. This is a half a year. So it has a 391.5 symbol there. Um, but the question is, so we have this event. This is midnight, the midnight cry, right? So this date here that he starts lying on his right side is going to be August 15th, 591 BC. So he's going to start lying on his right side at midnight cry. So we have midnight here and we have the midnight cry. And we have the symbol of August 15th, and we have this symbol here of the 15th day of the eighth month, right? So this ties us to Millerite history. But the real question that would need to be answered is why is Ezekiel referencing this event? The, the, simple, the simple answer would be, why is Jerusalem being destroyed? Because this, this has to go back to here. So Jerusalem is being destroyed, is connected to this event. And we know that he, he, um, uh, in those chapters, chapter four, five, and six, there's going to be lots of references to Leviticus 26 as well. So he's going to have some linguistic connection, uh, that is the words in used in chapter four, five, and six are going to be referencing words or phrases used in Leviticus 26. So we have a connection to Leviticus 26. So, so why is he connecting to this? There's some simple, simple answers. Right? Because this is about Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and it's destroyed because of false worship. But and I'm working on this. Yeah. And the false worship is also a type of a league because they have chosen to enter into a league with other gods and not the creator. Okay. Yeah. So, so we know that there is this league, that, that symbol of the 158. Gives us that symbol of a week. So we can see that August 15th, and this is going to be, remember, this is going to start the 40 days here, is going to mark the 40 years for Judah and, and the 390 days for northern Israel. And, and people have always tried to figure it out. They were, well, he's bearing the iniquity of the sins of northern Israel for 390 days. Now, northern Israel, how long does it? 
um, exist? How long did northern Israel last? Is there going to be from a 977 to uh, 721, right? That's going to be 256 years. So why is he, why is the 390 for northern Israel? If northern Israel doesn't even last 390 years. Is it 721 or 723? 721 is when Samaria is destroyed. Okay. 723 is when Oshia is taken captive. So technically, it's going to end in, he's going to be taken captive in the, the seventh year of his reign, and he's going to, his reign ends with the destruction of Samaria in the ninth year of his reign. Right? So if you give the number of years of the reigns of the kings of northern Israel, even though there's periods where there is no king in northern Israel, from the start to the end, it's 256 years. Okay. Yeah, the question is asked in the chat, what does it mean for him to lie down? Symbolization of what? Well, he, he's going to be bound so that he can't turn over. Um, and, yeah, so the good question, you know, why lying down? Why when he's sleeping? That he's going to be facing this siege. So he's going to bear the iniquity by lying on his left side facing this siege and then on his right side for 40 days so 390 days and 40 days so I, I don't know the answer why particularly lying down I know he's bound so that he can't move when he's lying down but yeah I don't I don't know the answer to why lying down is a way of bearing the iniquity I don't I'm not sure where that symbol comes from okay but, but the question is, why for 390 days? I mean, we know it's going to be 390 years for that event. But remember, this is northern Israel. And so since northern Israel only exists for 256 years, um, you're going to have all of this extra time. So why is that? Northern Israel doesn't exist. Why is he even talking about Israel? Why isn't he just talking about Judah? In the book of Ezekiel. So since he's talking about Israel. Mm -hmm. And we know that he is writing more for our time than his own. Yeah. Is he talking about us? Okay. So let, let's go to Ezekiel and take a look at this. So, and then there's a second question in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing that stuff there. I can't see these here. 40, 390 not be seen as 40 and seen 390. I'm not sure. I don't understand that question. Uh, one thing is uh, when we look at the 490, the 490, yeah, uh, yeah can be because the nearest, which is 50, which is Jubilee. So that, that's what I'm saying. Like I'm seeing the 390, the closest, which is uh the 400 and the 400, which can be like a 40, like Christ led into the wilderness for 40 days, the reigns 40. That's why I'm saying like the 390, I'm seeing a 39, which is more like a 40. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not certain what that would mean. Um. So, so we have this symbolism. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at this a little bit more in Ezekiel to try to understand this. So we know the siege of Jerusalem is being symbolized here, right? So he's going to lay siege. He's going to build a fort against it, cast a mount against it, set up a ramp. Like also against it, set battery rams against it roundabout. Then he's going to take an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. And set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged. And thou shalt lay siege against it. Uh, this shall be a sign to the house of Israel. So one of the things is we know that there's this sign. Now here, um, 
Yeah, so Angela asked a question. I don't know if I would relate it to that. Um, we'll, we'll just go there in a second here. I just want to address this idea of sign. So the sign is 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 a different word. This is the word oat. Um, this is uh, um, I can't remember what the other one was, um, but it's not the same sign as in the prophecy of Josiah. Right? So it's a different different word. Now um, he's gonna lay on that God's gonna lay the iniquity. So we have these words, you know, lie down, shakab to lie down, rest. Right here he's going to lay. Um, uh, so completely different word. So even though in English they could be related, they're not really related here. This is to mean to place something or put something upon somebody. So he's going to place the iniquity of the house of Israel <coughs> upon it. That is, he's going to lie upon his left side. And you're going to lay the house, the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. So the question always was, well, the criticisms of this prophecy. So we know that this is going to be a day for a year. And so when the Israelites for 40 years, they wander in the wilderness as a day for a year, they're going, that's going to be because of the 40 days that the spies were in the land. Right. So I'm going to give you a day for a year. Now, we know they're already in the wilderness for more than a year at the time that the spies go search out the land. So a year and a half. Some people sort of round it up to two years. But um, it's not predicting something that hasn't already begun. It's already commenced. So one of the things we can say about this 390 years and the 40 years is at the time that Ezekiel is given the prophecy, they've already commenced. He's given the end point of when this is going to, to finish, right? So he's going to bear the iniquity of this period of time. Now, so this idea here of bearing, that is to lift, right? That's Simple idea, definition, to lift. Okay, so he's going to have them set upon him, uh, that is put upon him, and then he's going to bear them. Now, we know that the same thing happens with Christ bearing our sins, right? They're gonna, he's, our sins are going to be laid upon him, and then he's going to bear them. And so this is a symbol that comes from the sanctuary, where sins are confessed or laid upon uh, a sacrifice, and then uh, the priest is going to bear that sin. Okay. Um, question, Dwight, or comment? No, I'm just look, just thinking. Okay. Now, so the idea that this is 390 days when Israel itself has ended, but you know, it says it to be assigned to the house of Israel. Well, the house of Israel does not exist, right? No, you could say, well, that's just referring to Judah, okay? But he's going to use this phrase, Judah and Israel, um, and, and I can't say that he's using them interchangeably. So, uh, you know, for instance, uh, when he in chapter eight and he sat in his house and the elders of Judah sat before me, right? That's his second vision, the sixth year, the sixth month, the fifth day of the month. And we know it's going to be, end up being six, six, six. Um, but in 20, he says, um, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So the question is, why doesn't he be, cons why isn't he consistent? Why isn't he saying Judah? Certain of the elders of Judah came to inquire. No, he's going to say certain elders of Israel. And in both cases, he, he's in Babylon, right? 
but he's going to use this Judah and Israel. So some will suggest, well, he's just using them interchangeably. Israel and Judah, you know, Judah as of, of Israel. It's one of the tribes of Israel. But it seems that he's using this in a symbolic sense. Now we know in chapter 37, he's going to refer to the two sticks, right? One for Judah. And one for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So even though northern Israel doesn't exist, he's going to be talking about Ephraim. So the question is, why? Why is he talking about a nation that no longer exists? Does does northern Israel ever get gathered? Do they ever exist again? Yes, it will. What's that? I said. Okay, because I I heard what I thought was conflicting statements. So northern Israel exists again after their destruction? We know in a literal sense they don't, right? Right. Never going to be gathered, right? There's no more northern Israel. You know, uh, it's they're not, you know, the people of Britain or anything like that, right? They're gone. Now, there might be some people who can trace their lineage back to some of those tribes, but they never get gathered again. So it's kind of weird when we think about it that Ezekiel is talking about Israel that is specifically Joseph or Ephraim, even though they don't exist. Okay, so so that's that's odd. You know, we just kind of take it for granted. You know, he's talking about it, but if we really think about it, they don't exist. And yet he's going to talk about these sticks. Now, we know that these sticks represent what we see in Second Kings uh, chapter. I always forget which chapter it is. Um, chapter 21 it must be yeah chapter 21 and and this is going to be about Manasseh because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel behold I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So this is referring to this line of uh, Jerusalem and this line of Samaria. So he's going to take this line of Samaria that has already begun with the destruction of Samaria, and he's going to stretch this line over Jerusalem. These are the two 2520s. This is the prophetic mirror, right? Now, in the prophetic mirror, do we have a gathering of Israel and a gathering of Judah at the end? Yes. Okay. Now, in context of these civil wars, one of the keys is that at the start of this prophetic mirror, we're going to have a civil war, which is going to be the one in 742 BC. And and it's going to connect with the civil war at the, at the time in 1863. Right? Right. Okay. Agreed. Okay. So one thing we can say about this 390 years, even though literal Israel doesn't exist, it must have some application to these lines of chronology of time. That is, that means we can connect events in the past that are symbolically attached to events in the present and in the future. That's one thing that we can see by Ezekiel's prophecy. That he's he's giving us a key to allow us to understand uh, how prophecy works and how symbols work. 
Because if we're going to take this literally that this is about Israel, it obviously can't be, right? Because literal Israel does not exist. Now, I know that there are, you know, Christians out there who would apply it to literal Israel, and they're going to apply it something to the future and all these types of things, you know, some 490 uh, years somewhere, 40 years somewhere, right? People do all kinds of things. But one of the things we know about Ezekiel is he's going to count uh, the years of the captivity, right? So in 592, it's going to be the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And if you count to the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity, you're going to come to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD on the 10th day of the fifth month. And so we know that Ezekiel can take events of the past and events of the present, and he can project these into the future. That these are not just, that these are very clear cut chronologies. Ezekiel gives us all kinds of uh, information about how to understand prophetic periods and how they're connected together. So the whole reason that we can take um, these, uh, I'm not going to find them here. The whole reason that we can take um, uh, these civil war visions, so wherever I have them in my list, find them. So we can take these civil war visions and do what we do with them is for the simple fact it's based upon principles in God's word that we haven't just arbitrarily connected 977 to the present. That these are part of how prophecy works. Right? So if we go here and say on. Right. So here we have 977 BC. Now we don't have Ezekiel's prophecy in here. But we can say that Ezekiel's prophecy is connected to this history. Right? Because it's going to go back to November 22nd, 977 BC, the 15th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. Okay? And so when we, when we do this, we look at this period of time, we're going to have, uh, for instance, the 25, 20 years, uh, going from, um, uh, 723 BC, right? We're going to have that. But we also have a period of, of 25, 20 years that has to do with the end of the Civil War. So you're going to have a Civil War in uh, 742 BC, and that's going to end in 739 BC. And that's going to bring us to November 28, 1782. So you can see that span of time there. Now, what is November 28, 1782? It's the Thanksgiving and National Day of Prayer proclaimed November 5, 1782, being observed on November 28, 1782. Now, um, so if this is in 1782, why, why did I put this here, this National Day of Prayer, November 5, 17, or November 28, 1782? Why are we looking at these Thanksgiving days um, in these lines? Okay, so 1782. What what's significant about 1782 as a symbol? Was it known the birth of William Miller? Okay, so it's going to be the same year that Miller is born, right? Yes, I hope so. Thank you. We also know just it's it's got the same digits as 1872. They're inverted, but we can see that that relates to the July 18, 2020 symbol. Okay, but it it is also since you're you're bringing 1782 into play. If you rearrange the digits a second way, you have the year of Ellen White's birth. Right. So she also has those digits. Uh, one eight uh two seven right so just a different order um now in um so this thanksgiving 
is in November 28th, 1782. Um, it's, it's a day of uh, thanksgiving and prayer. And I was trying to find it because I, I, I know I have some notes about it somewhere. Um, but the idea of when thanksgiving or the days of prayer occurred, uh, they were sort of random, right? They, there isn't like a fixed time. Okay. Now, so um, I'm trying to find the specifics about this one. Um, specifically, uh, okay, where's this one? This one. I had it yesterday set up and I, okay. So the Continental Cro Congress, the legislative body that governed the United States from 1774 to 1789, issued several national days of prayer, humiliation, and thanksgiving, right? The practice was continued by President Washington and Adams under the Constitution and has manifested itself in the established American observances of thanksgiving in the National Day of Prayer. The proclamation published in the Independent Gazetteer or the Chronicle of Freedom on November 5th, 1782, the first being observed on November 28th, 1782. So, now, there were different Thanksgivings that some of the states would implement and so forth. But here's, you're going to have this first one that's on the last Thursday of November, right? Um, so that's going to be in 1782. So there's going to be different times. Yeah, it's 241 years ago, Ron says. Um, so... So there, it, it comes around that this Thursday, um, now it's going to be George Washington is going to issue one as well, right? So George Washington is going to do a Thanksgiving proclamation on October 3rd, 1789. So this is the first time we actually have it as the president of the United States doing this, because before that we had the Continental Congress. So now you have the United States of America the president, George Washington. Um, and that's going to be October 3rd, 1789. And then it's going to be observed November 26th, 1789. And it's interesting that when Lincoln makes his proclamation, it's also on October 3rd. And it's going to, as well, that the date is going to be November 26th, 1863. And from then on, Thanksgiving is going to be uh, the last Thursday in November. One other time it changes to the fourth Thursday in November or something like that. I can't remember how that works. For a short time under one of the presidents, they, they kind of change how they do that. But, but the idea that it's this Thursday in November, this last Thursday in November, the first president to issue that is George Washington and the next president who issues it uh, is going, that it becomes a permanent fixture is Abraham Lincoln's proclamation in 1863. Okay. So we know that this is connected to these counterfeit feast days. What it, what it exactly means, I don't know, because, you know, we're not saying that Thanksgiving is some evil uh, date or evil feast, you know, counterfeit. But it's related to what happens in northern Israel. And as a symbol, northern Israel uh, becomes this apostate church, the false prophet, right? So in 1798, when the United States becomes a nation, at the same time when uh, the Pope is being taken captive, United States in that year is going to be recognized generally as an independent nation. Um, and Ella White puts the United States rising in 1798. She ties that to this two horned beast, this with the two horns of republicanism and Protestantism. Um, so we can see that that is connected with this history. Right? That is, it connects back to ancient Israel. So northern Israel begins to exist in 977 B.C. 
It's going to cease to exist in 721 BC. But it still exists as a symbol because it's 2520 began in 723 BC. So it's literal Israel is going to be scattered, never to be gathered. But it, it is gathered as spiritual Israel with the United States, with the Protestant country of the United States representing northern Israel. And Judah representing God's church that's gathered after October 22nd, 1844. God's denominated people. Any any questions about that? I know it's it's a lot of things. There's a lot more that could be said, but it should be enough to get the idea of how this is connected. Why Ezekiel is speaking of Israel and Judah? And why, just because Israel doesn't exist anymore, that the 490 years is addressing spiritual Israel ultimately. Can we see that? I would think so. Okay. So so it, it's, you know, if I was to write this out, I tried to write some of these things out in papers like the joining of the two sticks uh, to understand that. So if you read that paper, you can get more detail on it. But it's so involved to understand the application of Judah and Israel as they they symbolize things throughout history. Right? So, you know, we often use Israel and, and you know, we'll just use Israel referring to Israelites, right? Um, even after the only ones that are left are Judah and Benji, basically. I mean, obviously there's some others. And, and we know that in, um, in the New Testament, uh, we have, um, uh, uh, this reference to the ten tribes. And I'm trying to think which letter it's in. Romans? I don't think it's Romans, no. That's one of the small letters. I'm just trying to. Um, Yeah, it's uh, James. So in James 1.1, 1, 1, James says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, if he's talking about the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, do those tribes exist? It's a trick question. Do those tribes exist? No. Okay, so they literally don't exist, right? He can't be writing to the 12 tribes because they don't exist. But he can be writing to spiritual Israel, right? Right. That's, that, so that must be what he is referring to. Now, it's kind of interesting, the, the, he, the Greek number for diaspora, that's, that's that word scattering. Um, so when he says... Uh, Scattered abroad, yeah. So among those that are scattered, greeting. Um, but it's twelve ninety, and so the twelve ninety ends when seventeen ninety eight. Seventeen ninety eight. So it's kind of interesting that the diaspora in the group strong Strong's number in the Greek is twelve ninety. I just I think it's interesting coincidence, right? Um, but the idea here is that we can't take this literally. We can't say that he is writing to the actual 12 tribes. Right? Because they don't exist. So he's, he's using it as a symbol. A symbol of, of God's people that are, that are scattered, right? Because they are scattered. God's people are scattered. The scattering of the power of the holy people is going to end uh, specifically in um, 538. I mean, it's the 12, 1260 for the scattering of the power of the holy people. And then the treading underfoot is going to end in 1798. But they're still part of a structure, right? This structure, they're not going to be gathered until 1798. 
at the end of the 1290. So if we can see the principle that's here in the scriptures regarding Israel and Judah, we can see that we shan't take them literally. Right? We can't talk about literal Israel at the end of time as part of prophecy. We can't talk about literal Judah at the end of the time as part of prophecy. Because these are symbols. Okay? I mean, as Seventh-day Adventists, we should know that. But, you know, if we're going to look at the war that's happening in Israel, um, you know, we can't look at Israel and, you know, these different countries in the Middle East as being fulfillments of prophecy in some way. We can't go to the Bible and say, well, you know, this war with Israel, it's connected to, you know, literal Israel. It could be used as a symbol, right? So the war in Israel, maybe the dates and stuff can relate to uh, things happening in our lines or something. But the prophecies are not about literal Israel. The prophecies are not about literal Jews, Judah. Okay. And there are a lot of Christians who want to make it that way. They want to look at what happened, you know, in 1948 or 1967 as connected to some prophetic periods in the Bible. And there might be symbolic ways in which they can be connected, but they are not the fulfillment of prophecy. And I think we can all agree with that. Okay. So this is a really roundabout way to understand uh, what's happening in in Ezekiel and how why he's connecting these events of uh, chapter thirteen to Bible prophecy, right? And that we can continue to carry on this line of these civil wars that we can connect it to. American history, because America is the place in which northern Israel is going to be gathered, right? The Protestants are going to be tested under the first angel's message, correct, in the United States. And if that's the case at the beginning of the United States, that these prophetic periods can attach to the past, then we would have to accept that those prophetic periods are going to attach to our time, the end of the United States. Right. So these civil wars that occurred, you know, in Greece, they typify what's happening in the United States. But also these civil wars in Israel are going to be typifying what's happening. Right. So so. I hope that I've laid that foundation well enough, I mean, I don't think I've done a good job of presenting this, but because it's very scattered, but but we should be able to we should be able to pull this together and see this. This principle is being exercised here. And so when we have Josiah Lich's prophecy connected to this prophecy of Josiah, and we get this 391 and a half symbol, it's well founded in scripture. Now I don't I don't know what Jeff would say about this line presently. Right now he's he's writing about the twenty five twenty in his papers, right? So I don't know if anybody's been reading them. I usually go through and take uh, I, I, I skim through them and see what he's talking about. But right now he's talking about the seven times, and and he's tying it, of course, to Laodicean Adventism and Philadelphian Adventism. He has these these ideas, you know, that we have to become Philadelphians, which doesn't make any sense. It's neglecting to understand the the symbols of the seven churches and the messages to them, because the message to the seven church is the message we need to heed, right? Um, he's still going to be talking about these two witnesses and. You know, Zechariah, so he's studying some of the same things that we are. And um, he's connecting some of the same things, but he's neglecting others. But 
Jeff did accept, accept this diagram. So November 10th, 2019, three studies, fairly long ones, basically took up quite a bit of our time. I can't remember how long. But each one was at least an hour. Um, it's probably longer than that. So we probably spent you know three or four hours studying this. And, and Jeff did the last presentation. So after I'd done two presentations, if I remember correctly, Jeff went up to the whiteboard and then we discussed it. And he showed how this is correct. That he accepted this line. Whether he still accepts it or not, I have no idea. But he should, based upon what he understands about the 2520. And if we understand the joining of the two sticks, that, that this is what is being shown here. So the joining of the two sticks is going to be that period of time um, that ends these two 2520s, right? And then they're going to join. How do they join? So we have the, the prophetic mirror, the seven times prophetic mirror. How does this connect with the joining of the two sticks? How would we, we understand this? So if we got this seven times prophetic mirror, we have two sticks, one for Judah and one for Joseph and Ephraim, his companions, right? The tribe of Ephraim. So you're going to see the tribe of Ephraim, that is the line of Samaria, is stretched over the line of Jerusalem, right? That's how I drew it. That's why I put Israel on top and Judah on the bottom, because that's what the Bible says to do. And when we do that, and we take Isaiah 7, verse 8 and 9, the civil war that's happening there, 65 years, we can put it at the beginning of this, and we can put it at the end. And so we have this mirror, right? This mirror clearly marks that we have a prophecy given, 742, and the prophecy is going to be hidden on the 1863 chart. It's a civil war. The North is Confederate versus the South. Where in our history, the Civil War, the North is not Confederate. It's the South that's Confederate. This kingship is going to be broken. The kingship here is restored. They're going to not be a people, but we're now going to be a denominated people. They're not established. The SDA church is established. This is literal Israel and spiritual Israel, the literal land of Israel, the spiritual land of Israel, the U.S., right? And this 2,604 years, it's 84 times 30 plus 84, so 84 times 31 to get 2,604 years. And I remember when I first was looking at the 65 years, you know, it bothered me that it wasn't like 70 years, you know, like why 65 years? But of course, once we see uh, that it's divided into 46 and 19, and we have the prophetic mirror, then it makes much more sense, especially when you put it together as 2,604 years. So the 65 years becomes part of the structure. So, so if we accept this prophetic mirror, we would also have to accept that the Revolutionary War and that civil war that occur, so the Revolutionary War, we'll call it, you know, 977, and the civil war in 742. The civil war 742 is connected to um, you know, one is you have literal Israel, and now you have spiritual Israel. And spiritual Israel in the U.S., in the spiritual land of Israel, you have two sticks. Now, they are to join in this history, right? But where do we have the two sticks joining in our time? Where does Jeff say the two sticks join? Yes, it's right. Hold on, and one. Okay, I didn't catch what you said. Say it again. In our history, the two sticks join where? I didn't catch what you said. Uh, At 2001, September 11. Okay, well, okay, so 2001, what you're saying? I okay. said uh, at the Sunday Okay, at the Sunday Law. Okay. Um, now, we're in the time of the Sunday Law since 9-11. But more specifically, it has to do with the image of the beast. 
during the image of the beast test. That is, Protestants are going to join with Seventh-day Adventists. That is, Israel is going to join with Judah. Not all Protestants, of course, but those Protestants that are truly still Protestants. During the time of the image of the beast test, according to Jeff, this is when the joining of the two sticks occurs. It's between midnight and the midnight cry. In that history, we're going to see the image of the beast formed. And this is going to be a test for Seventh-day Adventists. And during that time, not just at the Sunday law, because the Sunday law is the test, right? You're going to have made your decision prior to the Sunday law actually coming for the most part. I mean, obviously, that decision needs to be continued to be made as that Sunday law approaches. But the church is going to be supporting this Sunday law. Right? So the organized church is going to support the Sunday law, something we believe. Now, that not, doesn't mean every person, uh, doesn't mean every leader, every pastor. But as an institution, that is the decision that's going to be made. But we need to support the Sunday law. And that's because Adventists don't really believe in Adventism. So, so people are going to support it and they're going to have reasons to do it. You know, um, but, but those reasons are not based upon God's word. So we're going to have, uh, this image of the beast being formed within Adventism, uh, but also within the world. So how that's exactly going to look. You know, some people would say, well, what happened with the pandemic was, you know, the image of the beast or things like that. And it definitely it's a precursor to it. Uh, but the papal power will be exercised in a religious over religion in that period of time. The image of the beast will be formed and people will start to recognize what direction things are going. Seventh-day Adventists, for the most part, will just support it. Uh, but the true Seventh-day Adventists, the ones who are going to pass the Sunday law test, and the Protestants, who are also truly Protestants, will join together. And they, they will stand at the Sunday law, the Protestants will, along with faithful Seventh-day Adventists. So, so this is what's going to happen. It's in that period of time. Now, we know we're not to that time yet. So, you know, when we start talking about a Sunday law being imminent and we haven't had all of these events that are clearly marked out in the spirit of prophecy that have to occur before the Sunday law, um, we know that we're not yet in that time, but we're approaching it. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we still have a work to do in giving a message. So this this understanding here that we're having regarding regarding these civil wars right so we have uh november 26 1883 that's that um thanksgiving Just let me get so you're gonna have november 26 1789 now when we put these different uh, dates on the line, so you're going to have this 25, 20 years when the Civil War ends. Now, this isn't exactly to the day or anything. I'm just using the years, 739 um, to 1782. And you just add those together, subtract one, and you'll get 25, 20. And then you're going to have seven years until George Washington's Thanksgiving. Right. So you get November 28th, 1782, then November 26th, 1789, seven years later. OK, <clears throat> and then I have uh, another date, January 1st, 1790. Um, oops. January 1st, 1795. National fast was appointed for February 19th, 1795. Um, and then January 1st. First, 1863, a national fast was appointed for April 30th, 1863. 
Now, why am I marking this 1795? The 1863 one's pretty obvious. Why, what, what's the importance of January 1st? Why am I marking that as the national fast was appointed? Right. That's going to be for February 19th and the other one's going to be for April 30th. So you got one during, um, the, the beginning of the United States and then you have one during the Civil War. Any thoughts on why, why I think these are important? Is January 1st the first day of the first month? It is, right? So is that significant then that we have these being proclaimed on January 1st? Now, we also know that uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect January 1st, 1863. Now, he's going to... Now, I'm not sure how that worked exactly. Um, if anybody knows a little bit more. So the Emancipation Proclamation, um, it was proclaimed on January 1st, 1863. So I guess he's going to proclaim that um, as he's going to also talk about this uh, day of prayer and fasting. So how does that work? So, so he initi initiated um, or issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation on September 22nd, 1862, um, which stated that enslaved people in those states or parts of states still in rebellion as of January 1st, 1863, would be declared free. 100 days later, with the rebellion unabated, President issued an emancipation proclamation declaring that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious areas are and henceforth shall be free. Right. So we got uh, 100 days later, which is an interesting symbol. <clears throat> so he's also at that time going to make uh, talk about this uh, day of prayer and fasting. Okay. Now, Ellen White talks about an earlier uh, fast that uh, she says that we are not to keep. Uh, but that one for April 30th, 1863, we were to keep. And, and that's because it was the first one was hypocritical. It wasn't until this Emancipation Proclamation uh, that we then can accept uh, that this day of prayer and fasting should be observed. Now, uh, just a couple of things. So we're going to go, we're, you know, we're not going to go more in detail here with 977 BC. But we're going to start looking at the Civil War. We're going to start looking at Isaiah chapter 7. And um, you'll see that 235 years is, is going to mark the point to 742 BC. Right. So 742 uh, B.C. is 235 years after 972 or 977. Pardon me. And 235 represents um, the Metonic cycle, which is 235 months. And we know from 742 B.C. to 723 B.C. is 19 years. So if we have 235 years followed by 235 months as a symbol, right? Now, I have the first day of the first mar month marked in 742 BC. Um, and that's going to mark the beginning of uh, Ahaz's reign. And 723 BC is going to mark around the time that um, the first day of the first month when Hoshea is taken captive. That's going to be a period of 19 years. So symbolically 235 months, whether it's literally that amount of time, we don't have specific dates. We can at least mark that as 235 months in 19 biblical years. So we're going to look at uh, the Civil War and, uh, and its connection to what happens in 723 BC. So it's going to take a little bit of time. 
Any questions before we close with prayer or comments? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. And we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to be with us as we study on our own and um, as we continue to search uh, through the scriptures to understand uh, our time. I pray that you can be with each person and that you can watch over them and that you can bring us together again to study your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.